Hello, my friends, and welcome to this month's edition of the soon-to-be critically acclaimed Behind the Gavel. I'm Andy Gavern, Vice President of the Lower Marion Township Board of Commissioners. I'm very excited this month to be joined by someone whose last name is even harder to pronounce than mine, Kathleen Aplanap. Kathleen's the Director of Historical Preservation at the Lower Marion Conservancy. Welcome, Kathleen, and thanks for joining me. Thank you, Andy. Happy to be here beside the gavel. Thrilled to have you here. Thank you. So I met you a few years ago at Stone Lee when uh, the school district was first proposing the new middle school, which is now Black Rock Middle School. So I've gotten to know you a little bit since then. But for our viewers, would you mind telling us a little bit about you? Have you always wanted to be a historian? Do you force your family to go on vacations to see historical sites all the time? Yeah, well, I've always been interested in history. Um, I remember that I used to love the smell of moldy basements and uh, <laughs> My mom took us on lots of trips to cemeteries, so yeah, I do drag my kids around um, pretty much everywhere we go. We have to have some kind of um, history site visit, um, but hopefully they'll learn to appreciate it when they're parents and dragging their own kids along. Nice. Do they Have they gotten into history or? No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> to put it bluntly? Right. Yeah. Give them a couple more years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you live in the township? I do. I live in Wynwood, and okay. I have lived here since 2000 and seven okay same house so um yeah I've, i uh have been somewhat involved in township happenings for a long time yeah. um as volunteer um, working with historic preservation and you know as involved with the community as i can be so That's great. it's a good place to live i, I love lower marion and yeah. i think it's fortunate that it, i have a house here and live here yeah now i have to ask is it a historic house um technically no <laughs> Uh, it's not listed on the Historic Resource Inventory. It's 1926. Okay. It's, it's in an older neighborhood. I think that counts, but 1926. Yeah, yeah. It's, it'll be 100 years hmm. soon. Yeah. And does it have a moldy basement <laughs> that you love so much? It doesn't, it's not as moldy as I'd like it to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that true kind of uh, you know, 18th century stone and wet oh. basement smell. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move on. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, you're the Director of Historic Preservation at the Lower Marion Conservancy. Can you tell us a little bit about the Conservancy and how your role fits into the objectives of yeah, the Conservancy? Sure. Well, the Conservancy, for people who are watching um, who, who don't know about it, we're a, a, a nonprofit, member-supported um, uh, organization. Um, uh, we, have, we, have, we have three missionaries, essentially. Um, open space preservation, so the Conservancy holds easements on a number of township properties, um, la um, land conservation easements, okay. uh, watershed, the health of the watershed, so um, we work in that area, and then um, where, uh, where I come in is with historic preservation, so uh, we, we do um, advocacy for um, um, historic resources, really trying to uh, maintain um, or um, you know, advocate for the preservation of resources in the township. Um, we have such a wealth of um, buildings and interesting structures and objects and whatnot from the late 1600s all the way up to the 1970s. Yeah. So it's just an embarrassment of riches. And um, so, you know, I do um, um, public advocacy. We have a lecture series and um, I spend um, a fair amount of time, I think, um, testifying in front of the board or planning yeah. commission about issues that are important to us. Yeah, and I was going to say, for, for those people at home who were like, I've seen her somewhere, you've been in front of our board a lot, and so for the, for the many, many, many people who are watching our commissioner meetings, you are there in front of us a lot and, and talking about the, the history of our buildings. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little mm -hmm. bit, and hopefully this isn't too big of an ask. Can you tell us a little bit about Lower Marion's history? Obviously, we have a mm. rich history mm -hmm. in the township, um, and why it's important that we acknowledge it, learn it, and, and honor it, really. Right. Well, look, our history, it, we have a long, long, long history, starting with um, you know, Native American settlement and going right up through the, the present day. And as I noted earlier, um, you know, in terms of the work that we do, uh, a, a richness of um, resources yeah. that reflect the history of the township. So, um, um, you know, very often people think of Lower Marion Township as this um, uh, place that has these remarkable um, turn of the century estates that were associated with the ra railroad and that is actually that is true um, you know Lower Marion is a sp spectacularly beautiful suburb but we have a lot more than that we have traditional neighborhoods um, we have 
um, small pockets of very interesting um, residential development. We have commercial areas that are older. Um, we have open space um, that um, is, is usually associated with um, you know, early, some early settlement. We have a river that has an interesting history. So um, we have very densely populated parts of the township and then we have um, sparsely populated parts of the township. So um, we just kind of have everything. We have, um, we have landscapes and we have view sheds and so uh, y y traveling from one part of the township to, the nother, to another, like from the east to the west, you get to see a lot of variety. Yeah. And I, I think, and I'm glad you mentioned all the different variety, because when people think of the historic nature of Lower Marin, they think of the buildings. Sometimes the neighborhood, right, are historic districts, but it's typically, you know, a certain building or something like that. And, you know, you, you've just given two lectures recently, and you talked about that being part of your job, one at the um, Humane Society and, and Skating Club, um, and another at the Kinwood Club. Um, can you tell us, I mean, those are both really fascinating properties, um, not homes, not, you know, not private homes like most people think. Can you tell us a little bit, um, and in particular, the, the humane, how is, you know, I thought the Humane Society when I first moved here was rescuing dogs and cats. It's a skating rink. How does that fit together? Why, what does that even mean? Yeah, well, that's yeah. a very, it's a very curious title, and I'm sure that when I first moved here, I. I, I wasn't quite sure what to make of it, and I, I don't even remember whether I, um, I took the time to, to think about or <laughs> research the name itself, but um, I, we had a lecture um, because I had been doing um, some work in, in the township um, with research and had located all these skating ponds um, during the late 19th century, early 20th century, up really through the 60s or 70s. People in the township used all sorts of mm. um, uh, iced over um, patches of water to ice skate. Yeah. So ponds and um, the mill ponds that were created by dams um, uh, on the river. Uh, you know they would flood. They would flood uh, flat spaces. And because ice skating was a really popular recreational yeah. activity, and so I did. I, I started to look into that. Um, and then um, I was contacted by somebody from the uh, Philadelphia Skating Club and Humane Society. Um, on another matter, and I thought, wait, what's th there's actually a really cool connection here. It's the history of skating in this township. Mm. So getting back to that club, um, the name of the club comes from its original uh, its its original utility, which was to save skaters on the Schuylkill River, and th huh. thus the name Humane Society. And um, the Humane Society and then the Philadelphia Skating Club merged in the 1860s, and their first building. Um, was downtown, uh, was on Boathouse Row. Okay. And they moved out to Ardmore in um, the 1930s. So it is the oldest skating club in the country. Um, and so the history wow. there is just really remarkable. Um, but on top of that, the building that is in Ardmore, which is off of um, Holland Avenue, near the, sort of the yeah. in the intersection of West Spring and, and Holland, is a, a kind of a, an architectural marvel in itself. Um, really well preserved, um, has a very um, devoted board and membership, and boy, an interesting history. So that was a yeah. pleasure to be able to do that lecture there. Yeah, it's also a really cool skating rink. My yeah, daughter, oh. my daughter <laughs> is, is, is a hockey player, and most most rinks have hockey boards. This one doesn't, right? Yes. But it's just for figure skating. Yes. And it's a really different. I mean, the ice is amazing, first of all. Um, so for anyone who has an opportunity to go check it out, you know, during an open skate, it's certainly worth going to. Um, yes, and I think the, the club management um, encourages uh, and, and welcomes public sp skaters yeah. on the weekends. Yeah. Yeah. So after the break, we're getting where we, uh, the goons behind the camera force us to take a break in the middle because we have sponsors knocking down our door oh, right, to, uh, course, you yeah. know, to, mm -hmm. to pay my salary. I understand. Um, so uh, after the break, we're going to talk about two big projects. One, the new middle school, um, two, which is kind of in process and to um, St. Charles Seminary, which we kind of just recently went through. Uh, so a little teaser, reason to stay mm -hmm. after the break. Okay. But can you tell us about a couple of properties or a property that you really love in this township, um, something that's important to you that may fly under the radar a little bit? Mm. Yeah, well, there, uh, there are so many properties that I'm sort of enamored of in the township. Um, I think we'll be discussing one after the break. Um, 
but if you could just give me a, a couple of seconds to really think nope. about the ones that stand out for me, um, I think um, that would be good. Okay. Thanks. You got it. Um, so yeah, I think uh, you know one one thing that's that's important to me is our historic code, right? We have this. You mentioned before your house isn't listed as a historic resource. Mm -hmm. um, we have class one, class two historic resources. Is that something that you get involved with? Is that something that you will, you know, work on as we try to improve? We're constantly trying to improve. Is that something that that kind of uh, implicates your your role? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the conservancy in this role, the historic preservation director, has always advocated for um, resources that are you know, really important and, and, and significant, and that we should hold to a higher standard um, than you know other. Um, resources in the township. So um, I have been very active and engaged in, um, in, in advocating for the ones that we believe deserve protections. So there is a process um, that the township has for listing both class one and class two. Um, it's, it's, um, it can be frustrating at, at times and I know not just for me but for um, people in the township that don't just care about preservation but you know just generally care about the character of the township and um, sometimes what feels like arbitrary decisions um, about what gets listed and what gets protected, but aren't really arbitrary um, because again, it's it, there's a process behind yeah. all of this, and it's sometimes it's slow moving. Um, but you know, we hope to see in the next few years um, um, a, a sort of a more robust uh, uh, update of our of our inventory that would reflect um, the the vast number. Um, broad spectrum of resources in the township that actually, you know, really do um, need protection of yeah. some kind. Great. And we'll, we'll talk about that after the break a little bit, but Mark is behind the camera right now waving me, waving me down. So it's time for our break. So please stick around as Kathleen and I continue to delve into our history of our great township. You stuck with us, thank you. I'm here with Lower Marion Conservancy's Director of Historic Preservation, Kathleen Aplinout. And we're, as you may imagine, talking history. So let's get back to it. So before the break, Kathleen, I had asked you about some of your favorite properties. You demurred saying that there's so, they're so, such a wealth. And then during the break, you couldn't stop talking about <laughs> property after property after property, boring all of us. Yeah, that's, um, uh... I'm, I'm embarrassed, um, <laughs> but thank you for saving yeah, me, Andy. Yeah, no, any, anything for um, you. Yeah, um, uh, but you did talk about this one property that's really neat, and I think it kind of flies under the radar a little bit. Yeah, well, I was afraid um, if I said it out loud, nobody would know what it was, and then you reminded me that that was the point of this, that you <laughs> want to bring, bring people's attention to uh, under the radar properties. So my one of my favorite properties, and there's so many, um, is uh, it's in Kinwood, Bala Kinwood near the corner of Old Lancaster and um, Levering Mill off of a little street called Parsons. So it's a, it's a little corner property. It's okay. a sliver of a, it's a triangle. And the building on that sliver um, is um, this, it's the same shape. It's a, hmm. it's a really thin triangle, kind of like um, the Flatiron Building in okay. New York City. And it's white stucco. Um, it dates from about, I think it's, um, 1940s. Uh, it looks really um, uh, German, very European, and maybe like Bauhaus. Huh. Um, so that's that ca that caught my eye, and I I just I grew to love it so much that I had a friend um, paint it for me, and, wow. and there it hangs in my living room. Oh, it's, that's it's so unusual. Cool. Um, that's so when next time you know you're driving down yeah. that area, uh, kind of across from Jaime's that kind okay. of crazy intersection. Definitely. Take a look at it. And, and um, you know, I do worry about it because it, um, it's had a whole bunch of tenants um, okay. over so the years. So it's not a residence? It's, a, it's, it's a not. It's a commercial okay. building. And, and I think the one thing that it has going for it, um, in addition to its you know, very interesting architecture, is that um, I can't imagine um, what else could be developed on this site. Mm. It's probably so... Um, you know, out of code um, right. in terms of its um, its setbacks and right, and just um, grandfathered in. And yeah, I mean, yeah. just even the size of the lot, it is just teeny tiny 
So, you know, hopefully that huh. would keep keep the wrecking yeah. ball from. That's really cool. I'll definitely have to check yeah. it out. So we're going to switch from under the radar to, I don't know what the opposite, over the radar, on the radar. Okay, that's prominent, right. prominent. Okay. We're going to go to a, a more prominent building, St. Charles Seminary. Um, we recently had a whole discussion, a whole se series of discussions about St. Charles. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the, the history of this building, why it's important, what we did and kind of what was involved recently with, with preserving that building? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that is one of the most important properties in the township. Yeah. Um, it's got lots of assets on it, not just the, um, the buildings themselves and their two campuses. Um, the upper end um, has buildings that date to the 1860s done by some um, you know, nationally recognized architects in the lower end in the 1920s. And together, that assemblage of buildings is just, um, you know, it's really handsome. And uh, the, the way that they're located and sited next to each other, but it also has a beautiful landscape. Um, I think it's in the area of 70 acres, if I'm not wrong. Um, that sounds about right. Uh, some of it was parceled off in the 80s for um, a development. So, um, you know, it includes open space and landscaping and historic buildings. Um, and, um, you know, it's got a beautiful wrought iron fence and it's got a view shed that's just to, you know, to die for off of Wynwood Avenue. Yeah. So we were fortunate, um, I guess it was 19 or 2017, the township elevated about 10 yeah. buildings and um, other kinds of resources to class one listing, which gives it a very high level of protection. So right. um, any kind of demolition of a contributing resource on that site, which is contributing a resource would be one of the assets that um, was identified as a um, you know significant part of, of that complex yeah. um, um, would receive you know a high level of um, of review if there was any kind of demo application put forward, um, any kind of changes to the exterior. So um, that's, you know, we're really fortunate. Yeah. Um, because an application did come through, yeah. right? Because uh, w why did that come through? The Catholic Church is leaving, right, is, is leaving the space. Right, so it, it, yeah, yeah, an application came through um, from the seminary itself. Um, yeah. They wanted to remove um, the um, features of the building um, on the exterior um, that um, had religious iconography. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, with the Historical Commission, because this yeah. is listed um, as a historic resource, uh, any, any changes, as I said, would, you know, would have to be reviewed. So the Historical Commission did review it, and um, their purview is limited to the outside of the building. So anything that occurs on the inside, you know, there's, there is no regulation there. But they did, um, they did review an application that proposed the removal of a significant amount of stained glass, yeah. um, statuary, um, uh, some fencing, um, and a nov number of other um, sort of historic assets. And so, yeah. you know, that was a that was a big disappointment to us, um, the conservancy. Um, you know, we we regard um, the, the stained glass windows as very integral parts of the entire campus. Um, but, you know, we, um, we're also, I think, fortunate to have a historical commission that really weighed the, the, the pros and cons and, and really tried to balance out um, the, um, its obligation to protect the resource with some yeah. of the compromises that have to be made to, um, to, to be able to maintain these buildings and with uses that, you know, d don't reflect their, their original uses. Right. And so... Um, you know, of course, um, we'll always be disappointed um, that um, more of the stained glass couldn't be saved. But you know, I think that um, um, the commissioners um, that, that that worked and very hard, and, and the staff that worked really hard. And I know that you were, yeah, I was you know, that. Mm -hmm. a big part of this. Um, Not uh, the working hard part, <laughs> just the, the deciding upon it. But you know, I think that commissioners. Um, you know, spent and staff spent hours and hours and hours, yeah. and the director of building planning, Chris Leswing and Greg Pritchard, um, all trying to come up with a, you know, a preservation, a positive preservation outcome um, that um, that uh, didn't um, result in you know a, a, a gross um, yeah. uh, change to the the campus. Probably, yeah, and I think it was. 
you know, from my perspective, I did I did spend a lot of time on yeah. this on this one, and it was it was a really interesting one because we had our township ordinances, including our historic preservation ordinances, and the Catholic Church has their laws, right? They have their canon law, which says that essentially they need to decommission the building and take away the religious iconography and all of the elements. And so these two areas of law were balanced against each other and kind of fighting against each other. So some of the things were easy decisions, taking statues, like taking a cross off of the property. But others were there was Latin writing that was a religious writing etched into the building and they wanted to whitewash that out. To me, that kind of tore at the fabric of the building. So it was a real, I think we came up with a compromise. Of course, we would have loved to keep more, but I think we came up with a compromise that both of us could live with, us and the, and the seminary. Um, and with every compromise, there was always some disappointment, but it's something that I think worked for everybody. Yeah, I mean, and also thank you for giving context to yeah. um, that conversation because it really came down to, you know, sort of township law against um, canon law. And yeah. I don't know that any of us were really well versed yeah, on that no. at the beginning and spent a lot of time reading and trying to understand yeah. what that meant for the building. And I think that um, it was kind of without precedent. So yeah. I learned a lot from it. Um, and I also, I think I grew to think about things a little bit differently while yeah. we were doing this. And so um, yeah. uh, I think that we're just fortunate to have so many invested and engaged people in the township who um, yeah. were willing to and, and really yeah. interested in, in taking a yeah. deeper dive into this. Yeah, so we're gonna switch gears to another just as magnificent property on the other end of the township, which is um, the property that is proposed for fields for the new middle school. Um, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about the ecology and protecting the ecology. There's 500 trees on there, a lot of mature trees. Um, but there's also some historic buildings that I think get lost in the conversation. We've only got a couple minutes left, but can you tell us a little bit about what are those properties, those historic buildings on that property and why they're so important? Yeah, sure. Well, you'd asked before about um, under the radar properties and I'd mentioned this sort of little yeah. flat iron building, but um, this, these properties have some really um, special um, buildings on them that I didn't know about until about four years ago when I was out um, at Stonely kind of looking over into the border to see what it was that um, the school district um, had proposed because I didn't know that these were even there. They're not listed. They were missed when the original inventory was done because they're landlocked and we didn't have that kind yeah. of technology. And you know, we have that kind of thing in the township where you sometimes you just miss these things. And right. And it's it's not intentional, um, but these have these have become you know really really important to the con conservancy because of um, they're uh, they're unique, um, they're greenhouse, um, they're buildings that were that were designed and built in about 1900 um, to accompany greenhouses yeah. on the old Stonely estate, um, and um, and they're really they're surviving and they're intact and they tell a really interesting story about horticulture there and um, and and design and trying to complement the the main house and yeah. so you know our, our hope is that the school district um, um, could adopt a plan for their fields there if they you know if, th if they use those with um, that's more sensitive to and maybe um, allows some of those buildings to be um, saved and yeah. perhaps um, you know a plan that still permits them to accomplish most of what they want with their programmatic goals, but to um, to save these resources because they're really one of a kind and once they're gone, they're gone. And yeah. we see them as a community asset um, more than anything. Yeah, and that, that property is right in my backyard, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Ward 6. And so it's something I've also been very involved with and, and really it is a pretty spectacular property. I think, you know, we're, I've been working with the school district to try to, you know, various members of the administration and the school board trying to figure out a plan that allows for the middle school fields that they need, the additional fields, but also respecting and, and preserving that property because it, it really is unlike anything I've seen in this township. Yeah, I mean, I'm, so, and I, yeah. I'm just um, so grateful that we're aligned on that. And I think that there are others in the township um, who would like to have that, that kind of outcome. Um, yeah. Because I think, that, I think that there can be compromise and I think that, um, you know, saying, a win-win that, that, that's a little bit too pat but I think that there are solutions out there that would allow um, yeah. some of these really important assets um, um, the historic buildings to um, to be maintained and 
used yeah. in some way. Either. Right. Cool. Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the really cool parts of my job is, yeah. is like that I get to hopefully leave a legacy that you know hundreds of years from now those buildings are there, there's fields around them, and you know people not only get to play sports but also appreciate what we have in this township. So hopefully that's that's how we'll we'll end up with that. And speaking of ending up, unfortunately we're out of time. I could go on all day talking to you. As um, could I. But uh, thank you so much for joining joining us. And uh, I'm Andy Gavron, and we'll see you next time on Beside the Gavel.